A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Arkadar. I'm head of product uh, for the data team at, at OpenAI. Um, I have to sincerely apologize that I'm not able to actually join you guys uh, in person. I have to say when I had to call the, the team who is organizing this event and uh, earlier today and had to let them know that, uh, you know, while I do spend a ton of time in London, I just happen to be in San Francisco, potentially traveling uh, really around the globe the next 48 hours. And, and I wasn't able to, to, to make it uh, to London in time to be uh, uh, with everyone who is uh, participating in, in, in today's event. Um, nonetheless, I, I wanted to share a quick message with you all. Uh, it's been a pretty exciting time at OpenAI. Uh, we just had our dev day. So I wanted to just share a couple of, couple of ideas and thoughts that have kind of um, um, come up over the last several weeks while we were thinking about our agent strategy, our platform strategy, the whole ecosystem of, of all these different companies which are going to be um, participating in, in this ecosystem, this pretty new ecosystem uh, that is coming together now. But before, before I get into that, I, I just wanted to um, maybe, maybe share a, a bit more about my thinking around, around what um, Gen AI is and, 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 and what does it mean? And why are we so excited about this? Um, and, you know, we, ha we, have, we have had narrow AI. Uh, this is not new. Like the, the world of artificial intelligence has been around for decades. And I think where things got really, really exciting and interesting is for the first time we have put together this, this artificial intelligence um, GPT that can actually generate net new content. Um, and that has not happened before. Um, but more importantly, what it's actually doing is um, it's kind of responding to very natural human conversations. And, and the way, you know, I, I try to kind of process it in my own, own, own mind, um, it's, it, it, it almost feels like a very natural evolution of what's happening uh, with the human computer interaction. If you go back in the days, you know, we're talking about like machine level uh, programming, right? Bits and bytes, uh, very complicated. Um, pretty taxing on the human brain and really not for everyone. So the, for the world population to be able to participate in, 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 in leveraging the power and unleashing the strength and the, and the, and the power of compute, um, there was a bit of a gap there. Um, and then we saw quite a bit of translation happen. We saw, you know, this new programming languages emerge. I'm not gonna go through every generation of it, but here we are where we have things like Python, which is very, very human readable. Um, it's, it, you can read a snippet of code and, and very quickly make sense of it, but you still need to have an IDE. You need to have like a developer environment set up on your computer um, to actually be able to write code and interact with the computer and, and automate things and build tools and systems. Um, but here we are now where you can talk to a computer in very natural language and get it to do all kinds of things, really. you can. You know, we, we write poems and we write essays and, 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 we, uh, and we use GPT, uh, ChatGPT as an assistant, but it, it goes way beyond that. Uh, we have uh, made incredible progress in, in code generation, code review, file uploads, uh, browsing. Um, we have uh, plugins uh, that we launched uh, several months ago. And all of this, like you can really put the computer in effect just by having a conversation with it in, in natural language, just the way we are having this conversation today. And I think that does something very, very powerful. Um, it democratizes access to such a powerful technology. It's no longer gonna be the case, and that's something that I, I, I truly believe in. It's not gonna be the case that you have to have a very specialized education um, to be able to leverage and utilize these technologies. I think it's becoming increasingly democratized it's, it's becoming very, very easy for, for general population to be able to engage with such technologies. And we as OpenAI, we have been very focused on building out this whole infrastructure, how to think about compute, our science of deep learning, how to think about data, um, how to produce uh, very safe, well-researched, well-understood models into the market, which are more powerful and, and can truly be a super assistant for us. And you know, while we build this infrastructure out, one question that we had to grapple with is what does an ecosystem look like? Who are the participants in it? And with that ethos, you know, when we think about it's becoming so easy now to write 
um, to write code. It's, it's so easy to interact with this computer. So should it be the case that very few are able to create tools and, and systems um, to be able to participate in this marketplace and actually monetize it and, and, and make uh, financial returns out of the, their ideas? And I think what we have accomplished in, in the dev day, you guys have must heard the announcement, uh, we launched agents, uh, GPTs, that you can give a personality, you can feed it new information, and, and they become almost this like, I, I can't call them autonomous agents yet, but these agents who are hyper-trained, hyper-focused on accomplishing a very, very specific task. And we believe we are going to see a proliferation of such agents, which are gonna be uh, designed to go and solve very, very specific problems. And, and that's a marketplace that we are, we are quite excited about. Um, outside of this immediate ecosystem, you know, we do partner with companies like Spotify, for example, um, and we recently launched uh, uh, with through the collaboration. We had recently uh, launched this um, this product that lets you translate any uh, podcast and into any other languages. And just like that, real time rendering, the podcast is getting translated. You kind of got rid of this language barrier. It became so simple, so cheap to be able to make uh, foreign language content available to some other uh, uh, listener who is not um, uh, maybe in a totally totally different language and, and make it increasingly very very simple for you to be able to do that um, i think this is just the beginning and and you know what we are excited about is to see how this ecosystem actually plays out one thing that's for sure is this technology this generative ai or let's say one day, if he once we get closer to AGI, uh, safe AGI, this really, really powerful technology will be available to the masses. We want um, uh, distributed benefits. That's one of the, the, the mandates of our charter. This is one of the, the ethos of OpenAI. And what that means is we are limited by our imagination. It's we are limited by our understanding of a problem, our definition of a solution, and our Kind of like, of course, the go-to-market and how you put it um, out into the ecosystem. But really, it's on us, individuals as well as companies, to go and find those problems, understand how Gen AI can play a role, create those applications, and take them to market. What it also means is, you know, do we still need hundreds and potentially thousands of engineers to be able to create such powerful systems? That's a question. And, and I think it's also a very powerful one. Um, if we are able to accomplish great things and it can be an engineer who otherwise was sitting in a part of the world where they did not have access to powerful computers or the kind of education that is necessary to create systems. But maybe now they have access to this. They can have a conversation. If they have a problem, they have a definition of a solution. They can actually bring it to fruition very, very quickly. And I believe that's very disruptive. Um, and that challenges the status quo and that introduces groundbreaking solutions to the market, which we might not have ever seen before. Um, look, this is a lot longer of a conversation and I really, really wish I was there with you in London and, uh, and uh, having this conversation with you in person, but I know there are incredible speakers that you will have the, uh, uh, the opportunity to, to interact with today. And uh, I would uh, love to to come and have a conversation with the with the with the community with, with folks who are showing up to today's event, and I'm working with the with the, with the organizers to see if we can do a virtual meet at some point. So thank you for taking notes. Thank you for writing down your questions, and I I I, I really hope to see you all soon. Uh, apologies again for for missing the, the event in person today. I am in a hotel in the middle of California right now, about to fly out in a little bit. Uh, and uh, but again, sorry, but very excited for the event, and I look forward to catching up with you all soon. Thank you, and have a good time. So apologies, um, but at least you've got you know a, a little message uh, from Arca, um, who was really really sorry not to be with us. I mean, what really struck me uh, from his message was. You know, first of all, the ability to, you know, to use natural language, you know, for programming, and I think that is really groundbreaking. 
I remember when I learned uh, computer programming, I learned how to program in assembler, you know, and it's like a language to, to be able to talk to a processor. So the processor is on or is off, you know, it's, it's not very straightforward and it's not very easy actually to, to do these kind of things and not everyone can do it. But now, you know, with a uh, natural language, you can, you, you, can, you can talk to a machine, you can program, you can do lots of things, you can create content, it's just really groundbreaking. And then I think the other thing that Arka talked about was really, you know, creating a marketplace and creating an ecosystem of DPTs, of apps, um, and that's an open ecosystem, and it's really harnessing the power of communities, not just from developers, but also from creators, and, and frankly, from actually anyone, you know, who's uh, creative enough to, uh, to create kind of new, um, new tools and, uh, and new uh, tasks and, and GPTs, as they call them. So um, I thought maybe there are some reaction from the audience, either in in, uh, in the room or, or uh, online. Um, Anka uh, promised to do uh, another session with us. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, please uh, do share them with us and uh, you know, we'll make sure that uh, they will be surfaced to him. Any, um, any questions, comments from the room or um, online? Yes. Thank you. Hi, Laura. Um, obviously, this poses a great challenge and a great opportunity for the world of higher education. And I know at LaunchWorks you have partnerships with universities quite prestigious here and in France. How do you see them adapting? Ah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, and we have actually uh, professors in the room, so <laughs> maybe they have some, uh, some ideas they want to share with us. Uh, there's uh, a few professors here, um, maybe Michael. Jacobides from I London's thought, Business I, School. I, I thought that I'm, I'm just, well, for once, I'm coming to a conference and I'm just sitting back and doing nothing <laughs> other than listening in, and little did I know. Um, uh, I am a little bit guilty and I guess I help coordinate the AI task force at London Business School. Um, and we're taking it seriously. Um, we just had a meeting of the task force um, uh, yesterday uh, and uh, or the day before yesterday. And uh, there's a number of different things that we're doing at the same time. Um, the first thing that we're doing is that we are thinking about the immediate issues, and the immediate issues are clearly issues that relate to assessment, and we are now changing part of the assessment, and I think that um, the consensus is that there's going to be some combination of uh, things that may be um, of the very old variety, so because it's extremely easy to feign half-decent an uh, um, answers, so now with the possibilities that Claude and more recently, literally a few days ago, the new edition chap GPT has, if you have a case study, it can spit a half sensible answer. The good news is half sensible. So it gets passing grades, it does not get good grades. And it's interesting, I tried it in my own course, up about 60, 60 something, otherwise you need to change your questions or you need to change your case um, and you need to adapt in a simple way. So the first thing is, how do we rejig the evaluation criteria because we have historically used the ability that you have in responding thoughtfully to something that relates to how you understood the context and how much effort you're putting in there. Unfortunately now a technology can do for you and basically you're going to say I'm going to have a mojito and I'm going to press a button and I will pretend to do that and I'm in an institution only to party which doesn't kind of work that well. So part one we're working on this and also working on things that assessments that are going to be more intelligent. To give you an example from my course, I changed the weightings and now I have a new assessment that says, drawing in all the cases that you have in the class, um, what would you have done differently from the case protagonists upon reflection and why? So that is comparative analysis, counterfactual and judgment in ways that AI does not easily do, and you're trying to tease it out. That takes you to the second big point, which is how is it that you can do things that go beyond what AI does? And that takes us to the big question of what are the capabilities that you need to have over and above what technology can give you, and that is the medium-term issue, and the medium-term issue is <coughs> 
how can you complement what you offer in this institution to be uh, adaptable? What else can you do? Well, you can start focusing on AI. I'm putting together a new executive course on next generation digital strategies that we're going to be doing in London Business School this spring and a new course on profit and fairness in the digital economy for the degree program. So we're thinking about how do we adapt some of the content to make it more relevant for the people who are in a business school. And then the final thing is with us, with many other institutions, there's an existential question. What the heck is our value to society as an institution when it isn't just to impart knowledge, uh, but we still want to have the ability of both expanding people's horizons and adding some value that can then be used and integrated. Uh, and my suspicion is that we're going to have even more of the things that we started doing a few years ago, which is more integrative exercises, things that are you know, like our global business experience and assignments that you go around the globe and you do things, things that relate to your initiative and the way that we support and drive and enhance it, as opposed to the one-to-many transmission of knowledge. Alas, in many academic institutions, and especially of the mass variety, you still have, you know, a guy or a gal who goes up and that says, here's a lecture and here's notes. I mean, you know, that's, that's useless. So what do we expect? Massive change, especially challenging in the bottom one where they haven't started in the journey of becoming sort of more adaptive. That, you know, boy, that puts you on the spot. Excellent. Thank you, Michael, for this very comprehensive uh, answer. So lots of challenges, but also opportunities um, for, you know, for academic institutions. Any other comments, questions, perhaps uh, some comments from online? Exactly. You're becoming a, a platform and an ecosystem working with lots of partners and stakeholders. So thank you very much. And uh, everyone in this room and online will be invited with a session with Orca in the near future. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.